welcome to Forbes India presents Legal Powerlist 2022 Summit and Awards in association with Legit Quest, a celebration of excellence in the legal world, honoring outstanding lawyers, law firms, and legal professionals who epitomize distinction in the legal fraternity. Selected by an esteemed jury who received over 2,000 applications in seven categories from 150 plus law firms. The winners shortlisted are legal luminaries representing dedication, leadership, and expertise. The accolades are not just for the individuals, but for the entire ecosystem that contributes to the legal excellence of India. Let's now embrace the wisdom shared by the law minister Arjun Ram Meghwal and translate it into actions that strengthen our legal landscape. ये अवार्ड देने की एक शर्मनी है. जिनको भी अवार्ड मिल रहा है उनको मेरी ओर से बहुत बहुत शुभकामनाएं जिनको नहीं मिला है वो और ट्राई करें उनको अगली बार मिले ऐसी भी मेरी उनको शुभकामनाएं कि हमारे संसद में जिसमें विशेष करके लोकसभा और हमारी विधानसभाओं में महिलाओं को प्रॉपर रिप्रेजेंटेशन मिले ये लंबे समय से विषय था तीन दशक से तो कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल लड़ाई लड़ रही लड़ी जा रही थी 96 से तो कि हमारा संवैधानिक अधिकार है धीरे धीरे जब देश आजाद हुआ आगे बढ़ने लगा क्षेत्र कोई भी हो महिलाओं ने अपना कीर्तिमान स्थापित किया अंतरिक्ष हो सेना हो हर क्षेत्र में पहुंचे और अभी तो चंद्रयान थ्री में महिला वैज्ञानिकों का ही सबसे बड़ा योगदान था तो ये सब वातावरण ऐसा बना कि पार्लियामेंट ने भी राज्यसभा में सर्वसम्मति इट्स ए वेरी डिफिकल्ट टास्क राज्यसभा में अपर हाउस में सर्वसम्मति और लोकसभा में खाली दो वोट अगेंस्ट में पड़े तो कितना बड़ा काम हुआ और उसके तुरंत बाद लीगल फ्रेटर्निटी में भी महिलाओं का प्रतिनिधित्व तो बढ़े मीडिया के यहां बैठे पूछने लग गए बढ़े तो मैंने कहा सुप्रीम कोर्ट ने भी कहा है ऑनरेबल सुप्रीम कोर्ट ने अपने फैसलों में कई बार कहा है कि लीगल फ्रेटर्निटी में भी हर जगह महिलाओं का रिप्रेजेंटेशन बढ़ना चाहिए लेकिन जो ई कोर्ट का जो एक काम है वो बड़ा काम ई कमेटी सुप्रीम कोर्ट भी कर रही है हमारा मंत्रालय भी कर रहा है सुप्रीम कोर्ट की ई कमेटी भी बहुत बड़ा काम कर रही है बहुत बहुत बधाई बहुत बहुत शुभकामनाएं Moving on to the next panel titled Approaches to Litigation and the Intricacies of a White Collar Crime moderated by CNN News 18's Anusha Soni A very warm welcome to all of you and indeed it's a wonderful occasion to talk about various aspects of law the Forbes Legal Palace 2022 not just we honor the people who have done incredible in the field of law and litigation but the critical aspects concerning regulatory mechanisms laws that need to be spoken of and we have a wonderful panel here I want to begin this discussion gentlemen with a conversation around the overall regulatory framework in white collar crimes what has been done so far in terms of laws and if we can set a broader paradigm for a discussion taking forward that what needs to be done which will begin with you uh, so we were just having a small discussion that you know what we are seeing these days you know what's the trend emerging out the enforcement agencies being very proactive what was the trend earlier as what we see now and i also was joking around that with the change in government earlier there used to be a three letter word which used to trouble us a lot <laughs> which was cbi now it has turned to two letter word which is ed <laughs> most proactive uh, agency right now so uh, and and with discussion with time obviously we'll elaborate more on this so we can take it forward that with the robust mechanism that and with the new change in laws and with time and again the new development uh, the sense of fear is also there compliance is there 
and with time uh, people have become more proactive toward diligence which was not there earlier this is jubilee your opening comments so uh, companies act 2013 made a landmark in the particularly this white collar crime because they de it defined not only the corporate frauds but also the uh, the put obligation on directors as well as auditor to report the fraud directors responsibility uh, includes the statement and the confirmation that they have got systems in the place to comply as well as detect the fraud so this was a my, uh, particularly this became a beginning great beginning in the decade and followed by the uh, other changes which are they are actually prevention of corruption act pmla act so it's going good yes the speed is not up to uh, what we expect but i think it's a good development not only this i would like to also mention that g20 um, movement where the we are um, actually chief in the g20 and we have started anti corruption working group two meetings have happened so it will definitely facilitate at least uh, the cooperation across the border gentlemen india aspires to be a 5 trillion dollar economy the startup hub that we want to become we already are but there's so much more needs to be done and it only points out to the pressing need that our regulatory mechanisms and our laws are better prepared to deal with the growth that we that we aspire to take is our system prepared for that uh thanks adusha very very interesting question in fact uh, uh, if you see the recent regulatory trends that we are witnessing uh, which was not there some 7 8 years back today if you see uh, what is happening is that most of these regulators have become very very active and uh, overall uh, people may call it fear uh, i call it uh, uh, compliance and uh, especially in a corporate world when we talk about white collar crimes and corporate frauds it's important that uh, the culture of compliance must be there samit to you the fear of compliance or a culture of compliance what will take the industry forward i think uh, there's one very good sentence if you if you don't do compliance see the cost of non compliance frankly you know someone says if you if you don't believe in compliance please see the cost of non compliance i think compliance is is something which is uh, at the top level in the corporate now because i've been in the corporate world for many years now as a company secretary also so i understand that you know you have to actually see that the risk policies the compliance policies are very very inherent very very important for an organization to run smoothly the corporate governance the compliance is because ultimately now we are in a situation or we are in a world where in everything is very transparent so you can't you can't do anything which is non compliance and then you think you can can escape out of it so i think uh, for example uh, you know uh, our prime minister has given very very good three high level principle in the g20 anti corruption ministerial meet you know what he said was that in international cooperation what i'm asking is i'm talking about the you know corporate crimes and other crimes he says that one is i'm looking for international cooperation in terms of regulatory provisions so that you know the country cooperate each other in terms of regulatory provisions second is asset tracing in terms of asset tracing you know there is a cooperation required and third one is the government and the enforcement bodies bodies to become ethical and that's what a very important point so therefore the prime minister set the tone in terms of international cooperation or for uh, preventing the fraud or preventing the corruption and that's a very very well taken by all the g20 countries i think mr sundaram why don't why don't you take this forward and talk us through it the importance of whistle blowers what are the internal mechanisms to take note of such complaints and what are the compliance aspects of it what is the best way to discover if there are any red flags in the organization or not and the best mechanism which is so well witnessed uh, by all of us is a uh, well defined whistle blower mechanism uh, what is important for all the organization is to have a very well crafted uh, whistle blower mechanism in place uh, and not just for the sake of it but also because those red flags needs to be Uh, looked into whenever a complaint is made uh, the it should be investigated one should go into the details of those uh, red flags and see if there is a truth in the matter or not uh, 
many a times uh, it has come out that uh, senior management tends to ignore these red flags right? for reasons best known to them they tend to ignore it scam of punjab national bank which is in the public domain uh, those whistleblower those red flags were completely ignored uh, so sometimes these travel bills there's entertainment expenses uh, how you engage with your third party consultants how you engage with your vendors these are important components where one should keep a very deep eye and look into any kind of a red flags that's uh, come uh, that is seen into this uh, so that's that's an important component sure. whistleblower in the white collar crime generally in corporate what happens is why there is a crime there are two things generally i feel one is the greed and second is the unawareness so for the unawareness you know at the top level what we see is that because they are not aware of the things and they have done some crime or non compliance we are here to make the policy so therefore we need to have a robust risk management compliance policy to take care of that now we can't do anything of the greed frankly when it comes to the greed or it comes to making more money out of the system in the corporate then it becomes a white collar crime wherein you know it's very very difficult because you are the part of the system you are part of the senior management and you are making such things uh, and you have some opportunity to making more money and you doing that it could be anything so i think that's where the whistle blower plays a very important role and i think it's a very very significant tool to curb the white collar crime in the organization and something that i'd also like you to touch upon is that is it important for us for the lack of a better word to have alternate dispute mechanisms you know criminality of course is one aspect which can't be completely married to adr but is there a middle way there was initially there were twin conditions which was there earlier with respect to enforcement directorate i was just coming back to it enforcement directorate we have seen the change in law initially the twin condition which was there was challenged in 2018 after the nikesh sarachan judgment after that what they did what was the anomaly in the law they changed it passed an amendment in 2018 amendment that was also challenged and finally supreme court said no it's not unconstitutional since then you've been seeing the investigating agency becoming so active you cannot put everybody in the same bowl but it's but but at the same time i i also suggest that when you say adr so obviously uh, criminality and adr they go poles apart but there has to be some way out i have represented clients in pmla matters who are not hardened criminals obviously there are certain policy which state comes up with and if you have to do business you have to go with these sort of policies and then there is certain practice which is there you have to follow the practice now if a person following the practice ultimately get caught in these sort of matters you see the impact on the society he is giving jobs to so many people now his business is shut what is the purpose of keeping that person behind the bar after the investigation is over <laughs> but then all these things are there uh, with respect to ed so uh, and i would i know that the panel can take it forward from here no but uh, just to add yes, you are even in the pmla uh, this recent may notifications uh, see now now the now the whole concept of kyc has changed it's not not only know your uh, customers it is also know your clients but if you are utilizing the money of your client for any of these activities uh, you are within the net so exemption is again very very limited to that extent so uh, all these professionals have been brought in one way or the other uh, when you are involved in the uh, in advising your client on the formation of a company right and if you are utilizing the money of your client which is ultimately discovered to be utilized in a in a money laundering activities you are in a soup so that's that's the change which is happening if you see the government has become very very sensitive it's no more those old days that you will do anything and you will run away with it so the law has become more stringent <laughs> i i just wanted to add one, two cents uh, the i agree with uh, um, ujwal uh, that there has to be adr the reason is not for the all kind of uh, particularly violations but where the money is stuck up imagine that 
bank's money of 10,000 or 20,000 CR is stuck up, and we just wanted to catch hold of that person. So we have to change that mindset that first get that money in. If I am a businessman, then I would like to have money in. Then I will, I am not leaving him particularly with a zero penalty or uh, the imprisonment. But my object will be to recover the money. The reason is that business has to go on. Even the uh, accounts, when they particularly freeze, the, it's very difficult to run, particularly complete industry goes off. And that's a really sad part of it. I know that uh, I am not, uh, the, it's, a, it's again, public interest comes and it's a breach of trust. But also, bigger picture we have to see if there are bigger uh, particular violations. Added, added to that particular uh, topic that you touched upon is also the issue when crimes like these transcend your sovereign boundaries. And we have seen various high profile cases without commenting on any of it further. But when a crime of this nature, white collar crimes mostly, become international in nature, your suggestion would be that we should focus on getting the assets or the money first and not so much on the person. No, I am not saying that. The reason is that we chase the person first. And people are happy, I, uh, we, we will put him behind the bar. But the problem is that the amounts are 10,000, 20,000 crores. Anybody who is the owner would like to first get the amount. Not necessary that he will leave aside that person. So internationally, I am not. Internationally, there are various challenges. Juristic, particularly uh, multiple jurisdiction is a challenge. Conflict of law is a challenge. And then when the particularly uh, the crime goes beyond one amount, definitely it translates to two or three countries. So these are many challenges, particularly when it is uh, across the border. But what I am saying is that there are, there are the right cooperations with the countries. And I feel positive side. Reason is that ESG is top of the world everywhere. And if ESG is top of the world, this will have to be Particularly, every com country will have to be co uh, cooperating on this crime. Now, when it is beyond uh, particular jurisdiction, I will just, on a lighter note, it's really difficult for the anybody to catch hold of them. Absolutely. Samit, would you, would you want to touch upon the aspect of insider trading? There have been various uh, high-profile okay. cases in this country. Yeah, so, uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, actually is very significant nowadays because Insider trading, we never used to take it so seriously in country, frankly. And at one point of time, we never thought that it's a crime actually, or it's a white collar crime or something. But now, you know, the reality is when you are making money on the basis of certain information which you have possession of information, or we call it UPSI, unpublished by sensitive information, someone is losing money actually. So the point here is that SEBI has actually done a very good job after 2015 to create awareness about the insider trading and their compliances. Sometimes we compliance officers feel that it's a very, you know, SEBI has gone, gone overboard or it's a lot of burden on us to do a lot of compliances in the insider trading. But the intention of the SEBI is really, really good and insider trading is something which needs to uh, stop because at, there was a time when, you know, when these provisions were not there, people used to take it as a perk actually. You know, it was never taken as a seriously as a crime or something. You know, I am working with a listed company, I have certain privileged information, I can always make money out of that money and that's, that's my perk in my organization. It started somewhere in US was the first country to start this after the Great Depression when they saw the money of the pensioners or the PF Trust or you know all these people who, was, who were in the stock market at that point of time, they have got, you know, all, all were vanished actually. So they came out with this law and almost every country has now law on the insider trading and I believe the SEBI has the most critical compliances in the world, I would say. I mean, I mean the kind of compliances you see if the you, information is passing through from me to Amar, we have to keep it in a database which is an untampered database, which is the height of a compliance. But still, you know, that is something which is a very, very appreciable step at the same time also, but <laughs> people are still, you know, struggling to do that. Yeah. And then the SEBI has also introduced the uh, whistleblower mechanism in insider trading now also. So then you can go and complain if there is an instance of insider trading you see and then you, there's a reward system and all, I don't know, I mean, that is not yet established or not yet uh, started, but I think there is a system for that. And uh, you know, this has to be taken very seriously. The problem here is, law says that even if you pass on the information, you are a criminal, even if you are not traded here, you know. So, so, the, so the information, passing off information has also become an offense under the law and 
therefore uh, we have seen many penalties imposed upon the companies though we haven't seen any uh, punishment or any imprisonment as of now but soon we'll see i think that also <laughs> Which we're talking about insider trading and various other aspects we spoke of. I believe most panelists highlighted the aspect that there's a critical public interest and public money involved when it comes to white collar crimes in almost all cases that we see because these are publicly listed companies. A lot of what has happened is lost in the technicalities when say I as a journalist report on the case. And I believe sometimes even to the public at large and the, and the enforcement agencies, the process per se, is it too tedious when you talk about prosecution of white collar crimes? Not in that sense, because just to add, first you have to bring back the fugitives, you know, to understand where they have literally invested and where is the money to first catch hold of these fugitives to get the proceeds of crime. From 2019 onwards, and I may be wrong also, but there are around 10, 15 fugitives, but I don't see anybody here. They're all out. So, plus, when it comes to recovery of proceeds of crime, that is very important. So million dollars have been recovered by these enforcement agencies, yeah. and especially with, uh, uh, and courts have also helped this, uh, these in enforcement agencies. Uh, when you talk about SFIO, there's a very recent judgment of Delhi High Court which says that if SFIO is it's a complete court, if SFIO is investigating, then EOW and the other enforcement agency should not interfere with that investigation. So, because that you have to create a mechanism to help these enforcement agencies also to, to do their job. We can go on, but that's all the time we have, gentlemen. Thank you so much for this very riveting discussion. Can we please have a round of applause for this wonderful panel?